Yeah, that yeah, looks about right. Mm -hmm. Better check the math on that. Oh, well, didn't see you there. Um, you just in time to hear about our newest invention from Mad Chris Industries, our uh, electromagnetic field radiating helmet built in with piezoelectric sensors for FORSAC recording data capabilities. There are two classifications of brain injury. The first is direct trauma and the second is indirect trauma. Direct trauma is a direct hit to the head that can cause the brain to do a couple things. The force can either cause the brain to collide against the front or back of the skull, which then the brain recoils back into place or recoils and hits the opposite side of the skull. The brain has inertia, so on sudden impact, the head will move relative to the brain and the brain will collide with the side of the skull, depending on which direction the hit comes from. The skull can also fracture on impact and the bone can penetrate the brain tissue and damage it. This type of trauma is usually seen in car accidents and of course sports. In indirect trauma, also known as shaken baby syndrome, this is a severe shaking of the brain that could potentially damage the tissue. If the head is accelerated too fast in any direction, the brain can distort and the tissue can be damaged. This is mainly caused by rotational forces and can not only damage the brain but can also damage the neck in situations such as whiplash. Okay, so I'm going to discuss the forces that are associated with different sports. Football, baseball, hockey, and skiing all involve violent collisions, and these collisions would produce forces that can badly injure and even cause death to players. Uh, these forces can be explained by uh, using Newton's second law of motion. It states the greater the mass of an object, the more force it would take for, to accelerate that object, and i.e. the famous equation F equals ma. But if we think about it a little bit differently, we can say that the force is equal to the mass of an object multiplied by the change in velocity of that object. And going back to various uh, sports, Popular Mechanics uh, reports that uh, a football player weighing 200 pounds and able to run a 40-yard dash in about 4.5 seconds can produce about 1,600 pounds of tackling force. In baseball, players can be badly injured by the ball flying in the air, and a pitcher that's able to throw a baseball about 90, 90 miles per hour uh, with the baseball weighing about 5.5 ounces can cause a collision that's uh, over 4,000 pounds of force. And these same type of calculations can be made for hockey and skiing. A uh, hockey puck weighs around the same amount as a baseball, about 6 ounces, and uh, hockey players can strike the puck, causing it to fly across the ice or through the air uh, over at over 105 miles an hour. And this can cause a force of about 5,000 5, pounds. A skier uh, travels faster than a football player, but uh, they typically weigh much less. But this velocity still causes a force that rivals that of a football player, a running football player. And that's about 2,000 pounds of uh, force. And these, these uh, numbers are why padding and helmets are extremely important or ne and needed to protect the players. The premise of the Magfish helmet is that externally the shell remains the same as your typical football helmet currently. However, internally the mechanisms and workings are a lot different. First of all, the Magfish helmet, just like the Maglev train, uh, which uses EM fields to levitate and attain higher speeds, the mag push helmet will uh, emanate EM fields that repel other helmets on the field, as well as um, repelling and mirroring the EM, the electricity that is generated within one's brain. The three things that are required for a mag push helmet to work is um, a magnet, a power source, and coils. So, what that does, first of all, is that the EM field that's emanated from the helmet will repel other helmets that are crashing into it. So in the case of football, where you have huge head-to-head -head collisions, you have helmets that are coming into full force with each other. With the MagPush technology, those EM fields will repel, repel each other um, to the point of not coming into full contact, and that'll really slow down, slow down that acceleration that happens when two heads are going to bash into each other. And slowing down that acceleration reduces whiplash, reduces the damage that the brain can suffer, direct or indirect trauma. The internal EM fields that the helmet will produce will keep the brain steady while this happens. So for example, if um, someone's head jerks really fast, like in a car crash or something, even though the head may not physically hit something, the brain is still hurt. Well, with this 
element will have an EM field that projects inward as well, keeping the brain steady even during those moments of high acceleration. So it'll basically mirror the electrical signals that your brain itself already produces to think and act, do actions and everything like that. That technology will keep the brain steady for reducing indirect trauma as well as direct trauma. So one concern that can easily come up is the weight of the helmet if we're putting so much technology into it. And I hear that out. However, if, our, if your first priority is protecting the safety and the lives of your players, then that is a fair trade-off to make for our high-quality, high-tech helmets. The idea that we have is a novel and it's a new idea because EM fields have traditionally been used for all sorts of things, for moving uh, scraps and garbage heaps. However, we haven't applied it to the field of sports yet and there's so much potential. EM fields do not require physical contact to stop the actual motion of an object or a human being. I'm going to talk about our novel two-fold approach for our helmet. So not only will our helmet uh, radiate electromagnetic fields, but we'll, they will also incorporate thin film piezoelectric sensors in order to detect uh, collisions whenever the players experience them on the field. Um, our diagram that we have shown is our um, helmet design, and the red arrows um, indicate the electromagnetic radiation that the helmet is going to have. It's going to radiate outward to deflect other helmets as it comes into contact, and then it's also going to radiate inward to stabilize the brain, which is why I have um, the two directions. Then we have on each of the cushions, piezo the thin film sensors so that um, every part of the brain can be detected should it have a collision. Data will be collected in how many G's of force the head experiences upon impact, as well as um, change in acceleration data uh, to detect whiplash. Ideally, the app will uh, update continuously throughout the game, with the highest forces uh, that the players will experience being um, shown throughout, and then um, the game data will be saved so that the coaches can go and look back on it later. Uh, colors will be assigned to uh, according to how much force is uh, the player experiences. So as you can see in our sample app picture, we have a list of players from the Bears, Go Bears, um, and they have um, a number which is their head trauma and G's and then their warning level. Um, and this uh, chart kind of shows where the cutoff is going to be. So you have 85 G's, which is um, 80, like anything less than about 85 Gs is going to be like you're in the clear, your green light. And then um, once you get above that, you get to your orange light, which is about 85 Gs to 100 Gs. And then um, your red light, which is um, over 100 Gs, which is about a concussion. So these are estimates varying, but they are going to give good data to your coaches so that hopefully if they see that these players have experienced these forces, that they can take them off the field right away and get the medical attention.